Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Tim Burke, and on behalf of the Securities Enforcement and Litigation Group of Morgan Lewis and Bacchus, I'd like to welcome you all to the what is now the 10th annual uh, SEC uh, Historical Society Presents program. And we are delighted to have uh, the co-directors of the Division Enforcement with us, Stephanie Bacon and uh, Steve Deacon. Um, but I did want to just mention, for purposes of the audience here in, in New York, that we are uh, webcasting this around the world right now. And this program will be uh, <coughs> on the SEC Historical Society's website, um, as have each of the prior nine uh, programs that have been part of this presentation. And uh, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce you to Jane Cobb, from the executive director of the SEC Historical Society. And for those of you who are not familiar with the society, uh, um, it is a fabulous resource. Uh, it has a virtual museum, uh, which you can visit by going to seChistorical.org. That is the definitive repository <coughs> of the history of financial regulation. And it includes uh, both original uh, 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 materials as well as oral histories and programs such as this one. So um, I thank you again for coming. We look forward to a great program. I know it's going to be timely, informative, and very interesting. And with that, let me turn it over to Jane Cobb. Thank you, Tim, and um, appreciate your service on our Board of Trustees. I also want to thank uh, Morgan Lewis and Bacchius for their long-term support of this particular program. Again, this is the 10th year for this, and we greatly appreciate the firm's support of the Society's mission to preserve the history of the securities markets. I have the pleasure of introducing the panel this afternoon. Um, on my right is uh, Ben Indek. Ben joined Morgan Lewis and Bacchus over 30 years ago, right after kindergarten, <laughs> and is currently a partner in the firm's litigation I practice. Typically go to high school, kindergarten's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben represents broker-dealers and their executives in SEC and FINRA investigations. Prior to joining Morgan Lewis from 1984 to 1987, Ben served as compliance officer for EF Hutton and Company. Now we're really getting away from age. To Ben's left is uh, Susan Resley. Susan joined Morgan Lewis about six and a half years ago and currently leads the firm's securities enforcement practice. Her practice focuses on representing companies and individuals in SEC, Department of Justice, and PCAOB matters, as well as internal investigations. From 1992 until 1995, Susan worked in the SEC's Division of Enforcement <coughs> in its Los Angeles uh, regional office. Um, to my left is Steve Pekin. Um, prior to joining the SEC as the co-director of the Enforcement Division with Stephanie, uh, Steve was managing partner of Sullivan and Cromwell's Criminal Defense and Investigations Group. Before that, from 1996 2004, Steve served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, where he was also chief of the office's Securities and Commodities Fraud Task Force. And uh, to Steve's left is uh, Stephanie Bacon. Stephanie, welcome. And Stephanie was named co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement along with Steve in June uh, 2017. Uh, before that, Stephanie was acting director of the uh, Division of Enforcement after serving as Deputy Director of the Division since June 2014. Stephanie previous, previously worked uh, in private practice and also served as a branch chief in the SEC's New York Regional Office and counsel to former uh, SEC Commissioner Paul Carey. Again, I want to welcome everyone and thank you and I will turn it over to Ben Indek uh, to get the conversation going. Thank you, Jane. Uh, welcome, uh, Stephen and Stephanie. Uh, there's a lot of hot topics that we can talk about, so let's just jump right in and start with uh, cryptocurrency. Um, there's a lot of activity in the crypto space, and we could spend the whole hour on that topic, but let's not do that. Uh, a few highlights include uh, the creation of a cyber unit uh, last year. Uh, the Commission's brought a number of enforcement actions in this space. Uh, it's reported to have commenced a wide range crypto investigation with the issuance of many subpoenas to market participants and most recently, you brought your first case in the regulated area against head fund and broker dealer. So here are a few questions to get us started in this area. Could you just uh, first 
bring us up to date on the work of the cyber unit and talk about its size, its remit, and its breadth around the country and what are the areas that it's currently focusing on. Yeah, happy to. Um, thank you again for having us. And uh, before I forget, let me. Uh, on, on both our behalf, give uh, our standard disclaimer that the views expressed today are our own, do not reflect the views of the Commission or the Commission staff, do not necessarily reflect the views of the Commission or the Commission staff. Don't necessarily reflect their own. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the cyber unit, um, thanks for asking about it. We do, love, we do love talking about our work in this space. Um, the cyber unit is now roughly 30 people. Um, <coughs> has a presence in five of our offices. Um, so the home office, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, but all of the offices also have a liaison to the cyber unit. And what we've really tried to achieve is, um, as with, I think it's fair to say, all the specialized units, we've really tried to achieve some level of centralized knowledge and expertise and consistency in how we think about these cases, probably in cyber, um, because it's such a new area, when I say cyber right now, I'm sort of talking more about ICO space. Um, we really, because there have been so many ICOs and there are so many potential things to look at, I think we've really had to be thoughtful about what we open in terms of investigations and what we bring in terms of cases, right? Um, so we've been pretty judicious about focusing our resources and looking broadly across all the cases, all the investigations, everything we're tracking across the division, um, and then coordinating centrally in terms of what makes sense to move forward on and that sort of thing. And I think the cases we've brought so far, the actions we've taken so far, sort of reflect that attempt. Um, the cases probably roughly fall into two buckets. I would say those that are sort of, um, you know, where the technology or the supposed technology is really clear for fraud. You know, somebody says it's this great blockchain business, and we do, you know. Um, we brought a bunch of cases, enforcement actions there, including um, emergency actions, asset freezes, things like that. And then the other bucket I would put in more of the, you know, not an obvious fraud and maybe not a fraud at all, um, more in the regulatory space, failure to register, perhaps some other sort of what someone might call a regulatory or technical violation. Um, so I'd say that the cases kind of broadly fall in those two categories and some of what we've been doing to try to reach as far as we can both with messaging and with action is, you know, in the fraud space, obviously bring those, those cases um, and bring them quickly where we are able to where we find the conduct. We've also done a lot of other things like trading suspensions where there's just not enough information in the marketplace. We've started doing, um, I shouldn't say we've started, it's now been probably nine months, but we've made some public statements, some Division of Enforcement public statements, which I think is not something the division's traditionally done, or at least hasn't done, you know, certainly in the, you know, recent past. Um, and I think they've been to pretty good effect. You know, one of the ones we point to. <clears throat> so one of the ones we talk about yeah. a lot is uh, there was a front page New York Times article on a Sunday about celebrity endorsements of ICOs and... Uh, talked about a coin, central coin, that was endorsed by the well-known investment advisor, Floyd Mayweather. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so we put out a statement, um, I think with OC, with OC, with OC um, maybe two days later, saying, hey, you know, if you're touting a security for compensation, you've got to comply with the anti-touting rules. And, you know, if you're a consumer and you're, you know, seeing some your favorite celebrity tout, you ought to be asking questions. Um, and really, I think we were pretty um, shocked to see that the conduct, all these celebrities, it fell off a, off a cliff. It stopped immediately. And so, you know, the alternative, uh, sort of what we would say the regular way to do it would be like, okay, let's send out a subpoena to the Floyd Mayweathers of the world, and then we'll take testimony. And then, meanwhile, this is going on for a year, and then eventually we might or might not bring an enforcement action. But here we're able to really um, stop conduct, um, you know, forthwith. <clears throat> and obviously we're not going to do that, um, you know, our enforcement program is not going to be finger wagging at people. We're going right. to investigate and bring cases, but in appropriate cases. And I don't cases. think that's and, to say we will or won't do investigations in addition to that, right, um, or at the same time. But as Steve described, it, we sort of think there's some value in coming out and saying um, in the right circumstances, right, and particularly cyber, where some of the, even though the law has been around for ages, right, the issues that it's applied to are new and different. Right. Um, 
So, and then finally, like I sh just sort of jumped to more the non-fraud type stuff and how we're approaching that. We've brought some cases in that space, as, as you've noted, including a recent one for acting as an unregistered broker dealer in the token lock case. Um, and in those, you know, we're again trying to be thoughtful and s try to choose the cases that make sense in terms of sending the broadest message um, and thinking about what are the right remedies here? What do the resolutions look like? Um, I think it's fair to say we kicked off most of the cyber activity with the Dow report, not this past summer, but the one before. Um, and so a lot of the cases have sort of followed from that. Well, I think that the getting the notice out with OC and you guys really did um, have an effect, as Steve mentioned. My, I know my daughter told me that her Instagram feed, all of a sudden, there were no more celebrities endorsing ICOs on it. So you definitely uh, hit the mark there. Sorry to disappoint. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, if you could, um, the, the sweep that you guys did, or a reported sweep in the spring, where you sent out a lot of uh, subpoenas to various market participants. What do you see going forward in, in, the, in that area with, with those things going out? Yeah, I mean, without sort of adopting the sweep terminology, um, you know, we've certainly sent out a lot of subpoenas in this space. We've, you know, I think been pretty open about the fact that we have dozens and dozens of open investigations and matters. And, you know, again, we're trying to be judicious about which ones it makes sense to pursue, which are the ones that by pursuing them first, we can send the broadest message. Um, and so that's really how we're thinking about it. I'm not sure I can give a lot more. You know, you see the cases as they come out, and I think you can see that we're trying to hit different areas. You know, we had the Munchie case, which was registration. Mm -hmm. We had the token lock case, which was the um, unregistered BD. We had the crypto asset fund case more recently, which was the unregistered investment company. Um, and so, you know, I think we're trying to cover as broad a landscape as we can, but we've got a lot of open matters that we're pursuing. Okay. Uh, on a related um, point as it as it pertains to cyber, um, separate and apart from that, there are the, the breach cases. So maybe you can get us to speed as to what are the developments for both corporate and registered uh, corporate issuers and registered entities. Yeah, yeah so I mean, Look, we've been saying, I think, for a long time that, um, you know, I think the, this, we probably said this at conferences for a couple of years, uh, saying, look, our, our goal here is not to, you know, bring actions because someone was victim um, of a computer intrusion or data theft, et cetera. But that being said, um, could we imagine a scenario in which, you know, a firm, either an issuer or a registrant, um, you know, controls, procedures, or disclosures were so deficient in the wake of that or in advance of such an event, cyber event, that it would be appropriate for enforcement action. And I think we said, yes, we could imagine such a scenario. Well, we don't have to imagine those scenarios since we brought two cases this year. The most, I think the one that's garnered the most attention was the Yahoo case in which Yahoo delayed for over two years in um, disclosing what was then the world's largest cyber breach um, ever. Um, and, you know, um, so Yahoo paid a penalty, or I should say the successor and entity to Yahoo paid a penalty. And, um, you know, there I think, you know, the, the allegations suggested um, deficiencies in sort of assessing the scope of the breach and making a judgment about whether um, there should be a disclosure that were so, fell so far short of the mark that it was appropriate for enforcement action. And then I think just last week um, in the Voya uh, Financial Advisors case, um, we charged a, a dual registrant um, with uh, violating the safeguards rule and the identity theft red flags rule. Um, these are the first time that you know, those uh, rule violations had been charged in enforcement action. Um, and these were the result of a of cyber intrusion um, that, you know, on reflection, um, we think that the, you know, the firm's um, controls and procedures around this were sufficiently lacking that, uh, you know, that enforcement action was warranted. So, um, look, I, I think we need to be careful in this space because um, cyber intrusions are, it's not just a securities law issue. It's, a, it's probably the greatest threat, um, national security threat facing this country, economic threat facing this country. So, being ham-handed in the way we approach these issues is not in anybody's interest. And so um, before we take action, we need to think about the consequences of an enforcement action. 
and are we are we promoting the kind of behavior that we want or are we chilling the kind of behavior that we want to see and we obviously want to fall on you know the former side rather than the latter side and i think when you look at the sp cases you know it's been a small number but i think when you look at the facts of the sp cases and we've tried to put enough information in the orders both in voya if you look back at um morgan stanley or rt jones or those other cases i think you can see you know i hope that it doesn't come across as sort of second guessing as much as it comes across as, you know, there were real failures here. Right. Well, maybe that's a good segue into talking about, uh, the, in terms of account intrusions, talking about retail investors, right? So from the Chairman Clayton on down, uh, it's been clear that the uh, SEC is, uh, as a whole, and particularly you in the in Division of Enforcement, is really focused on protecting retail investors. Uh, indeed, last year's annual report from the Division of Enforcement reminded me of the old Ford commercial, right, quality job one, uh, because you guys said uh, in your report, principle one, focus on the Main Street investor. Uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, how you're doing that. So one thing to start with is, in contrast to the cyber unit, which is a stand-up unit um, that you guys added uh, to, to the group, you set up a retail strategy task force here, so a little bit different. Maybe you can talk about the difference between a, the task force and a stand-up unit and tell us what the task force is up to these days. Yeah. The, um, so the task force, I mean, the, the unit, I think, is different in the sense that we really want to um, centralize expertise and develop it. Really, everybody's job in the Division of Enforcement is to protect retail investors, right? That's what everybody does. All the I can make an argument that any case we bring affects retail investors, right? No matter what it is. Um, and so, you know, we've always been focused on that. The idea with the Retail Strategy Task Force, and I, I should say sort of our annual report does reflect it. The chair everything the chairman says reflects it. I think everyone in the division is thinking about and embracing the idea of protecting retail investors probably in a more forward thinking, you know, front of mind way than perhaps in the past. Um, but the Retail Strategy Task Force, the idea behind that is to sort of have one centralized group of folks who are really responsible for thinking about the issues broadly. It doesn't mean they're focused on, you know, all the Ponzi schemes or all the offering frauds or all the you know, unsuitable product sales and those kinds of things, but they're really thinking broadly about across the division about, you know, what can we do proactively to identify potential pockets of problems, broad pockets of problems. And by that, I mean, you know, let's look at some cases we brought. Let's look at some areas where we did identify problems, where OC identified problems and think, okay, we had it here, say in Chicago. Is there a way to test broadly for that? Is there a way to slice and dice data to see if we have this problem much more broadly. And it makes more sense to sort of have a couple of folks responsible for thinking about that broadly, as opposed to expecting people, you know, in LA or in San Francisco or somewhere else to look at what Chicago has done and say, can we do more of that? So that's part of it. I would say um, they've been involved in some cases. For the most part, the task force is not tasked with doing investigations and bringing cases, but I think we felt strongly and the leadership of the task force felt strongly that people are more engaged and they develop ideas and, um, you know, in a more thoughtful um, and topical and relevant way when they're doing the cases and testing the stuff out themselves and everybody wants to do cases. And I think we had a better shot of getting committed people to this um, if we had people who could also do investigations. And so they have been involved in getting some stuff over the finish line. And then finally, education has been a huge part of what they do and they work together. I mean, obviously the commission has an office of investor education. Um, they work closely with them. I don't think they're really overlapping. They're really taking the lessons we're learning in our investigations and figuring out how to develop them in ways that can be messaged to investors as kind of the other side of it. Here's what you need to be looking out for. Here's what you need to be wary of. They're going out and meeting investors. We just made our first short video on the back of the spot option case that we brought at the end of last week. And so we've got sort of a two or three minute video that really targets investors. It's up on the website. So, I mean, that's kind of, we're, we're thinking about it a little more holistically and both the investigative side, but also the actual investor protection side. 
Let me pick up on something that you said there, uh, Stephanie, about um, you talked about big data, right? So that's also one of the priorities that you've been focused on. Let me put the two together. So protecting retail investors and, and big data. In a recent case that you guys brought uh, as part of the announcement, and it was a cherry picking case, uh, you, I think the commission said in the press release uh, that uh, the, it identified the problematic activity by the big data that it had looked at and the data analytics. Um, without giving away the secret sauce, or you can to us if you want, we're just amongst ourselves, you can. Uh, um, I wouldn't understand it if I thought. <laughs> uh, well, maybe Steve can tell us the secret sauce. Um, can you talk about how you guys are using big data to generate leads and then bring cases? Particularly not, in no, not in this audience. <laughs> But um, you know, one of the things I was most impressed by. I can by, get Mr. Mayweather here and we can talk about it. <laughs> one of the things I was most impressed by when I came to the commission is um, the quality of the tools that have been developed in house, um, not off the shelf, but actually we have programmers that have built tools that can, you know, in take an ingestion of large sets of data and analyze them to identify, you know, parallel trading and rings of insider traders or look at, you know, performance um, in an IA and identify a possible cherry picking scheme and the one that was brought was was built based solely on you know data analytics um, it was identified that way so um, you know I think that uh, you know everybody says big data it's like the term al Quran I'm not exactly sure what it means um, but um, we have a lot of people um, in circa and elsewhere in the division that are uh, quantitative and have tools and you know I think um, you know we're going to continue to seek out ways to take advantage of it um, one of the things the retail strategy task force is trying to do is use data to identify say we've got um, you know we are look at um, transactions in that are in a zip code um, around a military base do they indicate that for example there's some you know, complex financial product that's being sold to people of military age, probably unsuitably and inappropriately, is that a case? You know, not to prejudge the outcome, but that's the kind of thinking that I think they're going to do. And so they're doing that background work and then feeding these ideas to people in your group? Yeah, I think it's an, well, they're in our group, but it's a kind of an idea generation mm -hmm. group. Um, so, and theoretically, you would find a problem and then you would um, identify a pattern and disseminate it out, you know, all over the country and ask people to look for it in their particular regions. Right. I think one of probably uh, the major <coughs> retail area issues that um, you guys have been working on, uh, certainly in the RIA space, is uh, the mutual fund share class initiative. Uh, that's the second so-called self-reporting initiative that you guys have had over the last couple of years. It was one in the muni space um, prior to that. So two questions here. How do you identify areas that are worthy, potentially, of the self-reporting initiatives that, that you have put out? Uh, and then secondly, can you just give us an update and status report on where you are with uh, the share class initiative? In the, 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 just to take the first question, um, you know, this is one that um, this, the idea for this initiative was developed um, in our asset management unit because we had um, identified a problem that had cropped up and been the subject of enforcement activity over probably three or four years. Yeah. And we brought in probably 12 or so cases, um, I, really on the identical fact pattern, right? Um, an investment advisor recommending share classes that carried 12B1 fees that were paid to an affiliated broker dealer without disclosure um, of the potential conflict in that recommendation. And it became clear, I think, that the market wasn't, because um, we OC was continuing to detect this problem in exams. Clearly, the market wasn't getting the message. Um, so we had a choice, right? What can we do? We can continue to do these, play this whack-a-mole game, continue to you know get exam referrals, open up investigations. The investigations are intensive, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. And you know, by the time we got around to you know addressing the problem, well, I'd be retired, and <laughs> so would most people in this room. So the idea for the initiative is let's um, see if we can get. Um, you know, people to self-report this problem, remediate it, and you know they need it. They need both a carrot and a stick. And the carrot is, you know, the recommendation of no penalty if people comply with all the terms of the initiative. And the stick is, um, you know, the, the the threat that if we find it after the initiative is closed, and we're looking for it, um, you know, um, that we will, you know, try to be um, try to make people wish they had self-reported. So. And I, 
Yeah, and I think a couple things, you know, as Steve said, we're sort of had this problem, but to kind of put a couple more details around it, you know, this is part of what was driving us here is every case that we were resolving, you know, and they did have penalties, the cases we brought and resolved, but in every case we were resolving, we were getting disgorgement and getting it back to investors. And so that's part of how we were thinking about this, right? This is an opportunity to not only try to solve the problem broadly and much more quickly in a much more compressed time frame, but also get money back into the pockets of investors as quickly as possible. These are all going to be, at least the intention is for these to be recommended as self-directed distributions or respondent-directed distributions, which will have the effect of getting money back in the pockets of investors much more quickly. At the time we decided to do the initiative, I think we had probably 10 or 12 ongoing investigations in addition to the ones we already brought. And on average, the ones we brought took 22 months to bring. And so that kind of gives you the broad picture of what we were facing. Um, in terms of how the initiatives played out, I mean, I think it's premature to put numbers around it, but I think we view it as a wild success at this point. We're now, you know, we've got all, almost all the information and everything in. We've had a substantial number of self-reports, um, and now we're sort of working through it. And in terms of getting it done and over the finish line, the way we're thinking about it is breaking it up into groups of cases and giving it to as few people across the division as we can. So we have people across all the regions and in the home office taking chunks of this, but in an effort to sort of get it done consistently and as quickly as possible, we're also trying to you know, have as few people as possible do it. I mean, it's still a decent number of people, but um, so that's the idea. I mean, picking up on, on what both of you were saying uh, in terms of it being a wild success, and you guys had several tranches, at least two, maybe three in the MCDC space. So is this a tool that in your toolbox that you guys are going to bring out more often going forward, do you think? I think if we can think about the right way to do it, right? Not everything can be a self-report um, mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of reasons, but where it ticks the boxes in terms of solving a problem, doing it quickly, being good for investors, either because it gets money back to them or because it stops some misconduct or something like that. I think we're certainly open to it. I don't know, Steve, if you have other... Yeah, I mean, look, there's a, there's a, a policy cost in any kind of program like this, right? Because you're foregoing something that otherwise you would be getting. It, it's analogous to, you know, this is not an amnesty program because the, it's self the self-reporters will be the subject of enforcement action. But if you think about it in comparison to like the Department of Justice antitrust amnesty program, which I think by any measure is a tremendous success, but there's a pretty big cost to that program in that, you know, one of the actors, and they can be really bad actors, gets complete immunity. Um, so I think that's how we balance it here. We think the scales tipped in favor of the time issue and, and getting the, you know, the, um, you know, disgorgement returned to investors uh, promptly. I think one thing that you did mention, though, is also resources, right? Because it's a way for you guys to, to allocate resources. And that's the, sort of the last question I have on the, the retail space. So you guys have been focused on the retail space, but you've also been careful uh, in speeches and panels like this to make it clear that it's not to the exclusion of everything, right, else, and that uh, you also um, – do have an, an appetite for and have brought cases against financial institutions, Wall Street firms, uh, and those kinds of entities. So how do you balance the, how do you allocate the resources to those things? And you've talked a little bit about the intersection between financial professionals. I don't actually think it's an either or choice, right? A lot of the, you know, Wall Street cases that we've brought um, are cases that have significant impacts on retail investors, right? There's I mean, a retail so, investor at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be, a Wall Street case doesn't have to be a, a fight between Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, right? It, um, so um, so it's not a binary choice. But we're looking, we, you know, we have a complex financial instruments, uh, you know, specialized unit. Um, their work necessarily is focused primarily on intermediaries um, and large financial institutions. Um, and so I think, you know, there's no loss of appetite, um, you know, uh, in the division enforcement to, you know, go against, um, you know, important registrants, um, you know, significant financial intermediaries uh, and the like. Um, you know, I, and I don't think, I mean, the risk of repeating myself, it's not a, you know, a binary, you know, them or them kind of choice. I mean, in the, um, in the intermediary space, right, with the large institutional space, are there 
priorities or things that you guys are looking at the complex unit is looking at in particular is that you can share with us? Is well, I, I mean, the one thing I think that we've talked about and we can point out is the focus on the sale of sophisticated um, structured products and sophisticated um, products to uh, retail investors is one area that I know is of focus. Mm -hmm. And we've brought some cases in that space. Um, and, you know, I think there will be more to come. Yeah, I think other cases. Um, the uh, Kettery Grant case that we brought, you know, a week or two, maybe three weeks ago, I think is a good example of um, some of the stuff in that space, you know, these are products um, that in this case were unsuitable for the investors, but part of the problem I think is where, and not specific to this case, but cases generally is where there are products being sold that aren't understood by um, folks who are selling them. Um, and so there's sort of a confluence of issues there. People are buying stuff that aren't necessarily suitable for them. Those selling the products don't fully understand them. And so um, I would expect to see you know, we're certainly looking for those kinds of things and have investigations involving those sorts of issues. Yeah, we've also continued to bring actions um, about, you know, order handling, um, dark pool related stuff. And, um, you know, I think you'll see more of that um, coming down the pike as well. Okay. So switching gears a little bit, um, there were some significant Supreme Court cases that you know, certainly impacted. I hadn't, I hadn't noticed. noticed. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, impacted um, enforcement. And, and the first I, I wanted to cover and ask you some questions about was a Lucia case, which um, in June, as you know, the Supreme Court um, determined that administrative law judges uh, or the SEC uh, were not simply federal employees, but were officers of the United States and therefore needed to be either appointed by the president, courts of law, or heads of departments. And right after um, that, that opinion came down, um, the commission did take several steps, including lifting a prior stay on all administrative proceedings, which were kind of in a, in a pause mode, and then also ratifying the ALJ appointments. So have these actions returned the AP process to business as usual? Uh, I think the answer to that is a bit of a yes and a bit of a no um, in the sense that I guess a couple things. I think, you know, we've continued even while the case was pending before the Supreme Court, we continued to bring litigated administrative proceedings um, where appropriate. I think the degree to which we used the forum for litigated cases is probably, um, you know, reflective of how we'll continue to use it. And so, you know, we've certainly continued to use it and will continue to do so in cases where, look, there are lots of cases where we can only bring them as APs, right? There are some charges that can only be in the administrative forum. There are some cases, there's some, some relief we can only get in the administrative forum. We have to keep bringing them. You know, are we likely to bring an insider trading case or a financial fraud action in the administrative forum? I, I don't think we're likely to. I, we haven't in the last 12, 18 months, and I think the way we've been using it is how I'd expect to see us continue using it. That said, it's also going to be a very overloaded forum going forward because Judge Murray, um, the chief judge, just a week or two ago reassigned all of the ALJs, consist all of the um, cases consistent with the Supreme Court's decision. Um, and so there'll be a lot of activity. I mean, just based on the required timeframes and APs, I expect us to see it through the next year and then kind of know where it's all going to land. But look, there's going to be a lot of activity. We're going to retry cases. We're going to have to put a lot of resources into retrying cases, in many cases with very old facts. Um, defense power and respondents are going to have to put a lot of effort into this. So, so I think the next year brings a lot of challenge in that forum. And then hopefully, you know, after a year passes, we'll see it return to some level of normalcy. But I think normalcy is probably more what we've seen in the recent year or so, as opposed to what we saw three, four, five years ago. So it sounds like the impact on the enforcement program, for the most part, is how would you describe it? It sounds like there's not really going to be much impact. Well, I think we're, you know, much more judicious about the use of, of APs. And I think you'll see cases that I would describe as you know, for lack of a better word, kind of regulatory cases that we ordinarily wouldn't be bringing in federal court, I think you'll see more of those brought in, in, in federal court. Um, and, you know, there will continue to be 
you know, constitutional and legal challenges made um, to the AP process. Yeah. And so, you know, as we use the, um, the forum, you know, there's some embedded legal risk in there for us. And so I think, you know, we have to be mindful Talking of, of trying yeah. to mitigate that to the greatest extent possible. Um, a second case uh, that we want to talk about is the Kokesh case, which uh, they weighed in on, on another important issue. And there, um, the court determined that the five-year statute of limitations under Section 2462 applied to disgorgement orders, um, as it does to civil penalties. And how has that impacted? Um, because disgorgement, you know, typically wasn't viewed as a penalty per mm -hmm. se. So how has that impacted your program? Well, so first I just want to say one thing about Kokesh. So we, um, the Supreme Court's decision was 9-0, but the general counsel of the SEC points out that every one of those votes was really close, so we didn't actually, <laughs> we didn't actually lose it by that much. Um, That's a big data thing. <laughs> So um, it's been, it's had a, you know, uh, seismic is too big, but something close to it. It's had a very significant impact, um, not just on, you know, our ability to obtain disgorgement, but also on the way we do business. And, you know, I can talk, talk, touch on both. And so first of all, um, you know, there is conduct that, uh, or rather, Funds that are outside the, our reach because of the impact of the of the um, of the ruling. I mean, take Kokesh itself, and I'm not sure. At least in the the, the justice in that case is cause for celebration. Um, you know, Kokesh um, was found uh, responsible for misappropriating, I think, 35 million dollars from um, from clients, and as a result of the ruling, I think almost 30 million of that was for conduct that occurred outside the statute, he got to keep it. Um, so, um, you know, it is what it is, but, th and obviously the, imp the, the impact of that decision spreads much more broadly. We were, we've been keeping track of, in our litigated and settled cases, how much disgorgement have we had to leave um, behind as a result of the ruling, since, since the ruling. And I think um, the most recent stats I'm familiar with are from, I think, April or May, we tallied up about $800 million. Um, and I think the number has to be substantially higher now. Um, so, so, you know, it's a, a, for long running frauds, um, particularly those that we don't discover until they've been going on for some period of time, there will be, you know, there will be funds that, are, that should be, would otherwise be returned to investors that won't be. Um, so what does that mean for us? Um, you know, I think it means one, we've got to work faster. We don't have the luxury of saying, well, you know, we'll be able to get that remedy no matter how long it takes. And secondly, I think we have to be, um, you know, thoughtful in our case selection, um, you know, process. So, um, you know, if we're looking at conduct that is already, you know, three or four or more years old when we're starting the investigation, I think we have to ask ourselves the question of, you know, it's great if we do a really good investigation, but at the end we have no no real relief to get. That's not really the best use of our resources. Um, so I think in those two ways, um, it's uh, you know it's impacted us. I don't know if you have other, no, other no, stuff I think to add. No, no, captured it. Yeah. In the in those situations that you described of you know long running frauds that you may not discover until later in the scheme. It, do you foresee situations where the staff will seek tolling agreements more than, than they did in a pre-Kokesh world? No, I think it depends on, I mean, I, I think, you know, we continue to um, practice that, I think, uh, Rob Kazami put in place that requires uh, the director or, or his or her designee to approve tolling agreements. So um, I don't think tolling agreements, you know, what I don't want to see happen, um, I think neither of us wants to see happen is, we, we serve subpoenas with tolling agreements stapled to the back of them. There are going to be some cases, if we discover a Ponzi yeah. scheme and we're starting an investigation and we have someone who can toll, I don't think we're interested in letting, you know, the statute run and, and you know, money that we might be able to recover, see that, uh, you know, slip beyond our reach. But, um, you know, I don't want, I don't think the remedy of this is, well, we'll just toll. Part of the problem is even... You know, as we try to prove our cases, I mean, two things. One, 
I think our cases have the most impact when they're brought closest in time to the relevant events. Um, and then secondly, when we go to litigation, um, you know, if we're litigating and we go to federal court and it takes us, you know, through discovery and summary judgment, it's, you know, three years before we're in front of a jury, and we didn't bring that case until, you know, five plus years after uh, the events in question. So we're now eight years after the events in question and you call your first witness, um, where were you in, you know, 1998? I have no idea, you know. Um, so you can't prove those cases either. So I don't know if you yeah, have No, no, say. I think that's captured it. I mean, there's a lot of reason aside from Kokesh to bring cases faster. And I think every director before us has been focused on that. So I think there are a lot of natural challenges with it, but we've also been very focused on thinking about things we can do in the division and trying to roll them out and do what we can to bring stuff faster. Thank you. Um, let me switch t uh, topics to the commission statement on staff views. And while we appreciate you guys being here and giving your views uh, <laughs> to us today, uh, last month, uh, Chair, the law. <laughs> exactly, they are not the law. You've uh, jumped that. So yeah. So uh, <laughs> Claire Chait, uh, Chair Clayton issued a statement stressing that all the SEC staff often provides guidance on issues through various means, such as letters, FAQs, speeches historical society panels, et cetera. The commission's longstanding position is that such statements are non-binding and do not create enforceable legal rights or obligations, and that he had recently instructed the directors of enforcement and also the staff at OC uh, to further emphasize this. So can you give us some insight into the statement generally and the instruction to the division? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure there's much more to it to share other than the reiteration of, I think, what we all know to be true, which is that staff guidance is not the law, and we're not going to charge violations of staff guidance. Certainly informs how we think about things, and how, and I think it's good to give guidance. It certainly feels good for us to talk on panels and give speeches because we want people to know how we think about things, but ultimately it's the law that dictates and it's the commission that makes the decision about whether to bring cases, um, and if so, what to charge or what not to charge. So it's not a programmatic change. I don't think there's anything more there than than what he said, I don't think we're the only agency to have done sure. that. You know, there are other the banking rate before mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. banking regulators. So, mm -hmm. okay. How about whistleblowers? Continue to give out a lot of money uh, to whistleblowers who uh, uh, come forward timely uh, with original information, uh, and that leads to a successful action. Uh, last time we checked, the SEC had doled out awards of um, more than three hundred and twenty million dollars uh, to almost sixty individuals since the first one in twenty twelve. <laughs> What's new and interesting in this part of the program uh, in, in the whistleblower space? Yeah, we get well. We get a lot of whistleblower tips. <laughs> um, How do you separate the wheat from the chaff? I guess is that's part of a great it. question. I mean, most of this comes in. Most of it, not all of it. I think folks know there are some packaged up in a more sophisticated and advanced way, right? When whistleblower counsel comes in and brings something, but oftentimes they're just tips that come in. Most of the time, they're tips that come in through the TCR process, the tips, complaints, and referrals process. I don't know what the number will be, you know, when the book closed on fiscal 2018 last week, but I can say the year before, we had just about 17,000 TCRs, of which I want to say a third to a quarter were whistleblower tips, maybe 4,000 or so. And um, this year, we know we got more. I don't know what that number looks like yet, but we got substantially more TCRs. And so, you know, we've got our Office of Market Intelligence that does the first line triage every TCR that comes in, including whistleblower tips, should be reviewed in roughly three days, give or take, um, but should have eyes on it. Um, and so we continue to do it that way. The ones that are, you know, actually state, you know, look, we got a lot that don't state even a securities claim. And maybe we send them to another agency. Maybe it's, you know, any number of things. Um, but we rely on the staff to separate the wheat from the chaff. And a lot of the um, there are more advanced tips that come in, you know, through council, whether it's whistleblower council or some other council that, you know, brings us stuff that's more developed in terms of investigation. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, it's a great part of the program. I think, I want to say we're tracking roughly 700 cases that in, of our open investigations that have some whistleblower component to it. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty big, and we just recently earlier this year, I don't remember how many months ago, gave out the largest awards um, that we'd given out. I think um, two whistleblowers shared a $50 million award and a third whistleblower received a $33 million award. So they're pretty, there are some pretty substantial ones. Um, and, and a recent one to someone overseas, so really yes. opening up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a pretty, 
it's a successful program. I think it's been incredibly successful. You know, the downside of it is that you get more things that you have to go through, but, you know, in terms of complaints to review and things like that. Um, but ultimately, it's all positive. It so really at, the, at, at the risk of going back to Steve on the Supreme Court, another case 9-0, so I think it's 27-0 now, if I'm doing the math right. Uh, we got some votes in Lucia, though. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we must have. Right? <laughs> um, so digital realty, right? Um, Supreme Court case, uh, an, an employee um, must tell the SEC and and not their employer in order to gain whistleblower protections. Has that has that impacted the whistleblower program to date? What are you seeing in that in that area? I, th I think it's too soon to tell. I mean, sort of. I think logic would suggest that you know we'll get more whistleblower claims, um, but I, I think it's too soon to tell. Kind of an interesting issue, right? Because when the whistleblower rules came out. It really was industry, you know, the market yes. that wanted to do things to encourage whistleblowers mm -hmm. to report internally. And now we find ourselves in this sort of circumstance that wasn't the original, I think, intent, you know, mm -hmm. of, of folks. Instead, where people have to report to the SEC in order to be protected. Right. Susan, you want to talk about? So we've just ended your, your fiscal year. Um, and the very last case that um, the SEC brought was probably one of its most noteworthy, which was the, the Musk case. What would be the takeaway from, from that particular action, particularly for boards, as well as executives, particularly the entrepreneurial type executives that, that we see in where I'm from, San Francisco? Um, look, I, I don't know that, you know, we're in a position to sort of lay out all the lessons um, of the case. I mean, in, to some degree, the case, the allegations in the case suggest a kind of unusual fact pattern, right, um, that may or may not be repeated. But on the other hand, I think if you take a slight step back, it's really a case about um, controls, right? Um, at its heart, I think the core of the allegations against Tesla were you know, a reflection of, you know, a failure to exercise appropriate controls and have adequate procedures over the communications of the CEO. Um, and the, the thing to me that I, I think we sort of think is most significant about the case and the settlement is the manner in which the relief that we're seeking, which is still subject to court approval, but the relief that we've sought is very narrowly tailored to address the problem. Um, and, you know, I think it, we took a similar approach in the Theranos case earlier this year and just, you know, just to back up to Theranos. So there the relief required two things that are unusual, um, I think. One, um, that uh, the settling defendant, Elizabeth Holmes, um, had to convert her supermajority shares into common shares to basically give up um, control that she had obtained during the period of the fraud. And secondly, um, that there be a preference uh, to other shareholders that they receive the first $750 million in, in, share, in value should there be a liquidation event. Those were designed, remedies that were designed to address a particular problem, which is you know, the harm that could flow to investors from the control being vested in this particular person. Um, so, and the Therano, uh, rather the, the Musk Tesla case, similar, it you know, has a series of corporate governance reforms and enhancements to controls and procedures that are designed to address you know, the particular harm that, and, and problem that we allege in that case, which is you know, communication practices which were disruptive to the market and a lack of control over them. So I think what one of the principles that um, you know, we laid out as guiding our decision making um, as co-directors is to try to have relief that was thoughtful um, and tailored to address the particular problems. And I think if you look, these are sort of you know, relatively high profile examples of that, but if you look across um, a lot of the work that we're doing, we're not just saying, well, we're going to get that because we can, um, or you know, we're going to you know, assess large penalties so that we can, you know, we have a big pile of them at the end of the year. So um, that's kind of how we're thinking about it. But. No, I think that's exactly right. We really are thinking about what is, what relief is most important in this case and why, what do we think addresses the problem? And that's exactly what Steve said. And, and 
as we've spoken today, you've provided some, you know, insight on some key cases, and and you know, as as you know, uh, we will be seeing the the annual report with the statistics. Can you give us any preview of what we may expect to see with respect to trends or or anything along those lines? Probably. No, nobody's soon. nobody's going to go see the movie if we do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Probably too soon to tell. Um, I, I'm not sure. Look, we've been pretty outspoken about the fact that you can't pick us, shouldn't pick a specific time period and draw inferences from it. So I'm not even sure a year is a long enough time period to look at and say, well, the trend is this or the trend is that. But it's fair to draw some conclusions about the work that we're doing. I think we just, um, what we're going to stress in our annual report and will continue to stress as we speak publicly is really the impact of the actions, um, the substance of the actions, the quality of the actions. And we do believe that for every case the commission brings, people should be able to read that case and understand why the commission brought a case, um, what the commission's message was, what the conduct was that was troubling to the commission. That's what we're striving for. I think, you know, Probably no change in trends in terms of, you know, level of individual accountability continue to be a high priority. I'm not sure, you know, it'll be this many more cases or that many fewer cases as opposed to prior years, probably pretty close. A lot of stuff's probably fairly close um, in terms of, you know, looking at over a long period of time. But I think, you know, individual accountability was a big thing for us this year. I think we brought a number of cases, higher profile cases that said that, including the Tesla case, including Theranos, including the litigated case we brought against Rio Tinto and its former uh, chief executive, um, the case we brought recently against Walgreens and its former senior executives, the case we brought against Salix and its former senior executives. So I think, you know, and there are a whole bunch of others, but I, I do think that will be, whether it's a trend that shows up when you look at all the cases, hope that people look at the substance and say, you know, we really took that very seriously. And we're, we're three days into the, the current <laughs> fiscal year, but can you give us a sense of what the priorities are or, or what are some of your, your goals? Yeah, I mean, look, I, this question is, um, you know, we get it all the time, and it's, it, to some degree, it's an odd question because, I mean, I'm not criticizing yeah. you for asking it, um, but... I wrote it, it's okay. Yeah, no, the... Um, <laughs> look, the things the Enforcement Division does year over year, you know, 85% of it is constant. We don't, you know, nobody can come and sit in these yeah. seats and say, yeah, we're not really interested in Ponzi schemes this year. I mean, we're always <laughs> going to do those, right? And we're always going to do offering fraud. And we're always going to do financial trading. statement fraud and insider trading and FCPA and all those things. So, you know, really, I think we, you, you know, you shape it around the margins a bit. Um, I think, you know, this year, I think we're going to see the, um, you know, the share class selection mm -hmm. disclosure initiative come yeah. To fruition this yep. year, I think you're going to see you know significant developments in the cyberspace, right? Because that really, that unit was just stood up and is really just kind of it's out of its toddler phase, I think now and is learning to to run. Um, but there's a lot of there are a lot of investigations and those are moving through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know we'll continue to see um, you know actions as Stephanie talked about against individuals and you know issue disclosure, etc. The one thing you can't really control for is um, look, we're, we're living in a relatively calm market environment and stable market environment where we have very high asset values, right? And so a lot of trends of intense enforcement activity um, come in the wake of a change of that, right? And so, you know, I'm not, you know, looking for market cataclysm, um, but if there's some event in the market um, or around, you know, asset values, then maybe our priorities will yeah. get pushed and we'll be reacting to that. I just, you know, we just don't know. So. Can I come full circle as we uh, end here? Tim and uh, Jane talked about the, this being part of the SEC Historical Society and uh, preserved for future. And we couldn't let you go without asking about, uh, for you to comment on what your legacy, what you want your legacy to be when, uh, when you move on, you come in a, a long line of um, outstanding directors of enforcement. And when you look back on your career, others do, what do you guys want to be remembered for? I think it's still too soon to tell. I, but I hope that um, people look at it through the prism of the five guiding principles that we set out um, in our annual report uh, last year, because that is how we think about things. And I hope um, 
folks look at what we do and say, it made sense. Um, they brought good cases. We understand why they brought those cases. The remedies that they <coughs> sought in those cases made good sense. There's, we'll probably have a more developed view a year from now, but I don't know, Steve. Yeah, I, I just want hope people don't remember you as me as Stephanie's deputy. That's my <laughs> principal goal. Um, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, beyond that, I mean, if I look back to, um, you know, I don't have the longest historical lens, but if I look back at, you know, what Andrew did was um, that, you know, made a lasting impact was, you know, he made some terrific personnel decisions and left us in a position with, you know, really strong and and improved staff um, before him. You know, Rob made some tremendous structural yeah. changes to the division that, um, you know, I think really impact the way we go about doing our work every day. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll leave the division in a, in a better condition than we found it. Um, and, in, you know, we'll have empowered the staff to do their jobs, um, you know, more efficiently, more effectively than, you know, they were um, the day we, we walked in the door. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Uh, this has been uh, a terrific panel and we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.